Hello and welcome to Silent Podcast, where we are anything but silent. My name is Josh Kettles, and today I have the privilege of getting to speak with another contestant, a standout star from Netflix, uh, hit new reality show Outlast, um, Javier Cologne. Javier, thank you for being here. Welcome in. Thanks for taking the time to have me. Yeah, of course. No, we. I have gotten a lot of questions from people who have seen the show. Um, this is a brand new show, so with that, there comes a lot of questions, of course, of just of like, you know, how did it all work? Uh, was it real? <laughs> um, and uh, but then, of course, you know, just also some questions about everything that you went through because this was quite the wild ride. Um, not just yeah. uh, speaking to the Alaskan wilderness, but of course, speaking with the uh, just you know. As the tagline for the show said, it's not just about surviving mother nature, it's about surviving human nature. So um, we, we're yeah. going to get into everything here. So first, I just have to ask you, Javier, this is the b burning question I have. Did you have fun out there? Absolutely. I, I was in my element. I don't know if it came through because I'm more, more critical when I watch myself on, on TV. But uh, I was absolutely in my element. And I loved every day. I didn't complain about anything um sure things were hard but uh you know it was an, it was like an, a new adventure for me and uh alaska is beautiful and uh it's uh the time i had there was just precious really that's awesome to hear yeah i, I i'm glad to hear that because it seemed like you really were in your element i think when it comes to the survival aspect of the of the show they really highlighted your skills and abilities above maybe anybody on the show and so uh i would love to just start by asking you you know we get that first episode where you you get the quote saying you know i was scrolling on instagram and uh, <laughs> this uh opportunity popped up to audition for the show so why you know tell us about your background as a survivalist as someone who would be interested in an adventure like this so um yeah it um uh, i was absolutely right uh, about or i was absolutely honest about traveling for over 20 years um kind of uh somebody quoted it as uh the bohemian nomad they called me um i grew up in youngstown ohio uh kind of a steel town in the rust belt and uh it was a little depressed town so i was just you know, in love with the Travel Channel. And uh, there's a, a, a guy called Ian Wright, and he had a show called Globetrotter. And uh, he would r run around the world and, and see things with a little backpack. And uh, I told my mother when I was little, I said, that's what I'm going to do. And she says, honey, you could do it. You could do whatever you want. So I had to figure out how to be really creative because we, were, we, were, we didn't have very much money. So when I uh, left the house at, at 18, I started figuring out how to become very creative. And uh, a part of that was I could go places hiking on foot. And then uh, some years later, I discovered after a, a really beautiful hike across Spain, I did the Camino de Santiago, and that was in 2005. And then I said, you know, this took me 31 days to hike across the whole country. I want to do it a little bit faster. And what popped up in my head was a bicycle. I could actually just put my gear in panniers on the bike instead of on my back. And that just, oh, the bike opened up a whole new world. I got to see entire countries faster. I got to go to areas um, a little bit easier than hiking. Um, and so when, with, with that and the areas I was going to, I started realizing, okay, now I'm going to have to learn how to kind of live off in the in the wilderness and uh it almost became kind of a, a trial and error type of thing i would go on an adventure and then uh i realized oh i need a water purifier now because uh i don't i'm, I'm in an area with with very dirty water what can i figure out if i'm ever in this situation again how do i clean water how do i purify oh i ran out of food what can i eat in a desert what plants can i eat to get water it, it, it was really a lot of failure failing <laughs> while traveling and then learning uh, oh, to overcome those failures and become a better at at uh, at survival and and cycle touring bikepacking around the world. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, that that seems like a very unique background to bring into the, the show, because a lot of people have 
you know, maybe the um, the resume of, you know, I spoke with Joel, you know, he said he's an engineer. There's people that are specific, like, you know, military backgrounds. And yours is just like, I've, <laughs> I've just been this bohemian nomad and yeah. land for, for decades. And so that, that's very fun. Uh, I, um, I, I think I just would love to start by just asking you a little bit about your, your relationship with uh, Brian. That's the person who you seem to have spent the most time with out there. Uh, and so I, I will touch on some of the other personalities. So if some of you are watching and you're like, okay, I want to hear, uh, you know, Javier's relationship with maybe uh, some of the other people that he had a less, you know, a more contentious relationship with, we'll get to that. But I just want to start with Brian, because it really did seem like that was your core, you know, uh, so, so connected to your experience out there. So what was it like living with him? I think uh, Brian and I are like uh, an odd, like the odd couple. Um, <laughs> so he's a, He's he's a he he's, he eats boiled vegetables and skinless chicken, so he, his palate isn't too big, <laughs> and so anything we ate out there was pr pretty much new to him, whether it be the mussels or the crab. He had never tried crab in his life, so I, I, for me, I'm so passionate about food. I thought that was funny, and I also I, I really enjoyed kind of introducing him to new things. So whether that was uh, mushroom hunting or eating like um, uh, some seagrass, uh, everything I introduced him to, it, it, it was a, I got a big thrill out of, out of the excitement and watching him either enjoy it or dislike it. And we had our banter. We had really good banter. We had very little drama. He was, he's like a workhorse. And I think he said so in the series that, uh, you know, Javier says like something and then I know that I, I can be the muscle pretty much. And uh, we, we built a pretty you know, solid structure, a kind of a big cabin. We were cozy and warm. And um, yeah, we were, uh, we, I personally believe, and uh, I think Brian agrees, we were uh, the dominant team out there with so little drama after I see the series. I'm like, oh my God, we were rocking it. <laughs> of course, the, the, the ethical issues came up and I didn't expect that. That just yeah. changed the whole game. If it wasn't for that, me and Brian were solid. We, we really, um, I think, uh, we really, uh, you know, what do you call it? Um, we, uh, we complimented each other. That's the word is Got we complimented each other very well. My weaknesses were his strengths. His weaknesses were my strengths. And, uh, you know, I, we, 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 we didn't really let things get to us so much. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you touched on the ethical, you know, um, you know, insertions here into the, the game. And so I just want to ask, is there any more context you could give around Brian's leaving? Because the way that it was presented in the show, of course, he, you know, he kind of just sees everything going down and the, the trajectory of uh, where the game is headed and, kind of just uh nopes his way out of the game and uh decides to leave is that is that is there any more context you can give us to just his decision to to get out of there well of course and you know i i think i only recently understood um why and how brian left uh or why he made that decision uh it's because at the time so you know i've been i've been kind of still frustrated and angry and questioning myself why he left me like that Sure. But seeing his reaction and seeing uh, him say, I know Javier's the type of guy who would convince me to stay. And yes, if he would have told me, <laughs> I would have uh, obviously really convinced him to stay because I, I, I kind of felt he was not only my teammate, but I was also his cheerleader. Because yeah. when, when, when we got up, I'm like, rah, 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 Brian, come on, we could do this. And, you know, you, you, you slowly work yourself up, you kind of get the, the, the adrenaline pumping, and then you charge into the day and go collect your muscles and get your food. And, and um, so he knows, and now I see his reaction. He, he knew that, that I would definitely convince him or try my best to convince him, and that would make it all much harder for him to, to leave. Yeah. So um, I don't hold that against him anymore even though I did hold it against them <laughs> sure. for, yeah. for a while. Um, so, uh, and we, we had deep conversations about this because I knew um, actually 
uh, when the crab pot challenge happened, I knew the first time that we met um, Alpha on the beach while Justin was making his raft, they suggested uh, stealing all the crab pots for ourselves if we okay. made it to the island. And that, that I did not like, I didn't like that. I never yeah. thought that I would make a decision that would negatively impact another team because they weren't my competition. I did ne never saw that they were my competition. My competition was Alaska and Mother Nature. And we were going to not only survive, we were going to thrive out in, in Alaska. And so when they say, oh, let's make it harder for the other teams by taking all the crab pots, I, I thought, I don't like this. And as soon as we walked away, I told Brian, I have a feeling that these guys are going to get dirty. And Brian's like, no, no. I mean, I think they're just, you know, I have a different approach to, to winning this game. Um, but the, my predictions actually did come true. So... Yes, they did. <laughs> and so uh, I would I, I, let's get into it a little bit, because I think this is um, the thing that will that, that's going to keep, you know, your your show on uh, the trending Netflix lists. It's everything that goes down with Alpha Team um, and, you know, particularly with with Jill. It seems like, you you know, the whole promotional material for Netflix is a lot is is almost exclusively you and Jill uh, in that standoff <laughs> stills of you two uh because i think this this turned from a kind of a, a survivalist game into a you know much more of a social strategic game at that yeah. point and so at, at you know i think my biggest question is is how do you feel about you know what alpha team did to try to expedite your game um you know you leaving the game but then also of course bravo we see their team as well um, and so I, I think when you're having that standoff with Jill, you're accusing her of cheating. You're saying, you know, there you, <laughs> we still live in America. There's still there's still rules and laws, but yet the game did not account for any rules or laws. I think I just I, I'm curious to know exactly like what now in hindsight, what are your feelings towards Jill and, and towards Alpha Team and, and everything that went down? Yeah, um, n no, nothing has changed with my feelings towards Jill. I, uh, I disliked her then, and I still dislike her now. And um, I don't uh, agree with anything that Alpha made, or any decision that Alpha made. People keep saying the game, that this is just a game. And I, I don't think, I don't view it as just a game. This, this was a competition, and this was a competition to outlast the other teams, but it's not like uh, playing chess. And I think Paul brought it up, like, we know, we're, we're playing chess, not checkers. Somebody said that in the series. And I was thinking, you know, th this, isn't, uh, this isn't squid games. That's what I kind of felt like. I was, I was thinking, how can you be so just mean to people? It, it was beyond understanding for me that um, it had to turn that way. Uh, in the game, I would think that we could communicate with our uh, the other camps. We could say, hey, how you doing? How you guys doing? And we could chat nicely. And we, they, you know, I, I would have even offered uh, assistance if somebody said, uh, I'm constipated. Javier, you, do you have any idea? You know, can you help me with constipation? I wouldn't have hesitated to make a tea and help somebody to, to relieve their constipation just because I would want them to have a more... Um, I guess, level playing field to, to, to challenge me. Because really, the, the competition was us against nature. And uh, I think we were all on uh, a ride there. I think a, like a, a beautiful journey. I know it sounds really hippy-dippy. But yeah. I, well, I, mean, I, I just view the nature stuff and outdoor stuff really kind of in a romanticized way. Yeah. So I never saw this as um, destroy... Or, or eliminate your competition by any means necessary. So yeah. I, I can't see it that way. Do you, uh, d were you someone who was a fan of other reality competition shows like Survivor or Alone or anything else like that? Um, I, yeah, because I like- have, The only reality TV I ever saw was uh, Road Rules on MTV okay. and the original Real World. 
Yeah, okay. So I have we're never 20 years seen, ago. <laughs> yeah, I have never seen any other reality show. And going into this competition, people were like, oh, uh, you know, uh, was it alone? And and I go, oh, I've never seen it. And they go, what? How could you? Why are you doing this show? And I'm like, well, because I'm really good at being in the outdoors. I don't need to see a show that teaches me how to, uh, I don't know, manipulate people or hurt people. I, I don't know. I just didn't watch any of them. Do do you feel like then though that there is some um like I guess mixed expectations then for someone coming in like to the show like Jill who maybe is thinking of it more in the in the realm of a survivor where lying and backstabbing is um, part of the game people do that all the time and they manipulate each other and then they get voted out and then you know all of them are friends afterwards because they it's they see it as poker where it's you know or chess like you're saying it's like um more of a understood aspect of the game now because this is a new season and a show which i love had very little rules um because it really put it on you guys and and created these ethical dilemmas that were real out there but do you feel like then that mixed i don't know i think i'm just curious to know like do you feel any empathy or or understanding for someone who would come in with it with a different perspective um N no, no, I don't have <laughs> a, a empathy a, for what, yeah, yeah. what, what those, those decisions. I don't have any, um, and, uh, you know, I, I tell you one thing is, is in the show, you see me look at the camera and I said, the whole world's watching. I have to admit that I must have said that to Amber and Jill more than a dozen times. And I warned them and I said, what you're doing, the whole world will judge you will not be able to explain this incredibly disrespectful behavior. It was amazing. And, and uh, they refused. And I'm like, I felt is, this, is, this, must, this, is what must, this is what it must feel like to be on Jerry Springer. I just thought <laughs> this total chaos and, and ridiculousness, it doesn't have to be like this, people. I mean, calm down. And um, they could have. Because really, realistically, <laughs> it was only me. Had they not uh, done some, some terrible things, I might have joined them. You know, I, I might have joined Jill and, and, and uh, Justin and Amber uh, if they were nice. But they weren't nice. So <laughs> that was like the, the cutting point. It, the money never even came in, into my mind. And um, you could see from Joel and Don... Um, and a few other uh, others, the others, I don't, I never really talked to the others. Yeah. So, um, I don't really have a relationship with, with any of them. Um, but, but the, some of the others from the show, they, they also kind of had some moral dilemma. They also kind of had some, some, uh, boundaries that they wouldn't cross. And so we weren't, we weren't the minority. The minority sure. was the, the, the three, uh, on the demon squad. And, and the decisions that they made that basically took over the show from a survival show to a, yeah, it's just, it, it became almost like a video game. I don't know. It was a, a Grand Theft Auto in the woods, wasn't it? it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, your colorful commentary uh, is coming out here and it was also a very present on the show calling them, you know, the goon squad or I, I don't know that, <laughs> but I, I love the Grand Theft Auto in the woods. That's what I'm going to use uh, uh, just to discuss the show and convince people to watch it. Um, because <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, it was at your expense, but this, this show was great television and I think it was really <laughs> compelling because I, yeah, like I shared this with Joel, but I just, I think that reality TV often tries to manufacture drama and they try to manufacture um, ethical dilemmas. And sometimes it comes off very shallow because um, it's not real suffering, not real pain. What Joel and Don went through three yeah. nights in the wilderness with, you know, below freezing temperatures. That's real. Yeah. That that's real. Yeah. And I mean, and that you can, and you can, you don't have to experience it to, to have a lot of sympathy for them out there. Um, what you went through trying to, you know, I think losing, you know, Tim and Corey early, then Brian, then trying to convince, you know, Joel and Don <laughs> to stay in the game and then bouncing over to Charlie, trying to convince them to let you join, uh, you know, all that stuff I think we can understand was not, you know, that was not manufactured. That was a surprising twist of fate brought on by real human decisions. And so I think it, it just, it was so compelling. So um, I guess my next question I think is just, um, when you were 
uh, I rewatched every scene that you were on the show uh, last night. And uh, there was one thing that caught my eye, which was that freeze frame uh, um, of Brian's letter. And I noticed that on it, he, oh. he, he had addressed Paul, Don, and Joel. And he had shared, I think the part that I could read, he said that, you know, Paul, I loved our fireside chats. Um, those things will stick with me forever. And I, I was just a little confused because obviously that didn't make the show. And there's, I know, like they use less than 1% of, you know, for the, of, of your time out there for the footage for the show. But could you give any more context about the time that you spent with Bravo team or sorry, Delta team? Um, yeah. Yeah. So out there. that is just a mistake. <laughs> That's not uh, my thumb. And oh. I was going to, I was going to call. That's a, that's a letter that I think, uh, I think yeah, that must have been Jordan, Jordan. Yeah. Jordan yeah. wrote that letter to his team uh, because we didn't talk to Paul. We didn't have fireside okay. chats. We weren't, we didn't talk to them at all. We didn't know anything about them. Okay. And you, you uh, mentioned that you had, you had talked with them a little bit in what you were sharing with me that you had a relationship yeah. with them, but it yeah. wasn't at that point that you had had combined camps or there's nothing like that. That was not shown in the show. No, no. It, so they just used a shot of a letter and uh, maybe they should have just, uh, they didn't, they didn't capture one of me reading Brian's letter. Got and okay. uh, at, at one point on Reddit, I was going to call it Thumbgate because my thumb has a huge nail and, <laughs> and the thumb that's in that picture has a very tiny nail. I actually think it might be, uh, uh, I think it might be Paul's thumb. So I'm like, whose tiny thumb is that? I wanted to track down Thumbgate, the big okay, controversy on Reddit. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, th this is uh, makes a lot more sense because I was just so confused how Brian was so not only the content of the the letter of or the that he's addressing it to Paul, Don, and Joel, but the emotion behind it just did not seem very Brian esque from what we got to to know of him out there. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, then let, let me let me discuss. So we've uh, after everything goes down. You're going over to Charlie um, and you're trying to convince them to let you join the team. And your pitch, if I could summarize, comes down to, hey, I just want to head down this mutually assured destruction path. I want to make sure that Alpha doesn't win. If you let me join, I am just going to try to do everything I can to not let them win at this point. Was that a genuine – was that your genuine strategy at that point? Or were you, was that what you thought was the best pitch that you could give to Charlie for them to let you join? No, I, I, I honestly believed that uh, it would be so demoralizing for them that I made it to Charlie. And then what I was going to do was talk to them every day on the other side of the river. And uh, it would have crushed them. They, they had no raft. They had no working raft. So they hike around to get to Charlie camp. It's actually, I think, six miles. So they couldn't easily get to Charlie. So alpha wasn't a threat at all to charlie mm. and i tried to explain that to them that basically we gotta just uh i mean we're, we're doing good so if we're five we can uh, get plenty of food i mean i i didn't know at the time that angie had those problems she didn't poo for 24 days um i make tea i was making tea for brian i even made tea for for joel um and i was taught this tea by uh in, indigenous people in in alaska so uh, it, it's good for, for uh, constipation and it also is uh, like relieving and, and calming. So if you're very cold and you're shaking, you could drink this tea and calm down. Um, I would have made a tea for Angie. So I would have potentially saved her from leaving the show. Yeah. Um, all these kind of things I would have assisted. And if the team didn't like me, I told them, if you want me to go, as soon as Alpha leaves, if you don't want me to stay, I'll leave. I'll shoot the flare too, because I would love to talk to Alpha on the boat ride back home. Um, I was thinking, I have so much to say to Alpha. I have so much to just um, kind of really, uh, more so questions, like why would you do that? Why would you treat me that way? Why would you be so disrespectful? Um, that, that was the, 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 the big question in my head. And I know that if I would have been in front of Alpha Camp, because they were right by the river there, um, every day eating and just uh, saying hello and watching them do their thing, they had no way to, to get over to my side. Uh, uh, Justin didn't have the energy to do another swim because this was a couple, two weeks after he did the, the, the st uh, st stole the sleeping bags. 
And uh, the energy he needed to stay warm, and he's so thin with no body fat, I was a polar bear out there. So I'm like, there's no way Justin's doing another swim because that knocked him down for a day. I think he was took him a whole day to warm up. Yeah, um, yeah it, it was an honest offer. Um, and I, uh, it's unfortunate that I didn't get to, uh, to, to see Alpha leave, really. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I can imagine. So that, that, that um, you also clarified for my, what was going to be my next question was that your plan wasn't to go back and attack them. It was, to, it was really to taunt them. It was going to be psychological warfare. And that's the, the limit of where you would have gone in retaliating, quote unquote, to, you know. Yeah, I would have killed them with kindness. <laughs> great but still try to kill them quote unquote. <laughs> um okay well then i think uh the the next question i have is um is that standoff that you have with uh with jill and how long did that go on for um when she was at your camp yeah so um it wasn't a sneak attack uh jill told me so we were preparing for, the, I was making my raft and the, the ladies approached me and they basically told me right then, uh, it wasn't only in the camp. They told me right there on the beach before Joel got into the water and I, before I was finished with my raft, they told me, uh, we're, we're not going to let you stay here. And, and I just brushed it off and I kept making my raft and moving the raft to the water. And then they, they went and they told me, we're going to, we're going to steal your shit. And I was just like, no, you're not. You're not going to steal my shit. And also, I, I kind of felt reassured because I knew that I could see them if they tried to go up to the camp because they there was only one entrance, basically. They would either have to go up that one entrance or go back down the beach and make a huge detour to go up into the forest. We were kind of deep in the forest there and up a steep climb, a steep, muddy climb. And um, I had... Uh, I, you, you can barely see it in the ser in the clip, but uh, I had taken a huge fishing a gill net I chopped up I found on the on the on the side of the river, and uh, I took a huge piece and I wrapped it around the entrance of my uh, my cabin. So I knew that that was basically like a booby trap. If mm -hmm. anybody tried to run in and try and grab my sleeping bag and my shit, they would be uh, a little bit uh, frustrated by trying to figure out how to get around the net because I wrapped it around sticks and tangled it up pretty good and tied it. And that's exactly what happened. So I, I kept an eye on Jill and Amber at the, at the shore and then uh, I could see them sneaking. And I, I'm just really, I thought this is like uh, some middle school shit. I just thought these idiots are gonna, they're gonna do it. And when they did it, I'm like, okay. So I start running and I caught up to Amber pretty quickly. She was frustrated and I, I grabbed my uh, backpack that I had, and in that backpack I had a, a couple of my warm layers. I grabbed that, and she, you know, just kind of huffed and puffed. And then I ran up the hill, and Jill was already up there, but she was kind of tangled in my my uh, the fishing net. So I see her trying to get into the the area where my my ship was, and she couldn't get up there. So I kind of just laughed, and she starts trying to rip off things she could, like tarps, and she took a, a one of my inner tubes. And she tried to, she pushed down a, a, a couple logs that I had uh, leaning against my, uh, my cabin. And I'm looking at her like, okay, you've had enough. You had enough. Now, I don't really know how long the whole thing lasted, but I tell you, it was complete chaos. We, you could, we could hear uh, uh, production, the cameraman running around yeah. and I was seeing, seeing them. And I actually looked at them several times. I think I did a whole monologue about what's wrong with society. <laughs> <laughs> I went on a speech and uh, I was thinking, I, I was getting like Citizen Kane feel. <laughs> I'm like, what's wrong with society when people can't even camp in the woods? <laughs> I'm like, you're attacking me. This is cheating. And they're like, it's not cheating. There's no law here. And I'm thinking, oh my God, at what point? We're surround. We're in a national forest. Of course, there's laws. I'm not allowed to make several dozen traps. They're they're illegal. I can't do a pit trap to to capture uh you know uh, uh um any animal because it's it's not it's unforgiving. You don't know what you're catching. Um, 
or a, um, a tidal trap for fish. I couldn't dig a, a passive trap that captures fish. So there's so many things we couldn't do. Of course, we're, we're abiding by U.S. laws and Alaskan laws. We're on federal national forest land. They even told me to stop cutting trees because I was cutting too many trees. 27 trees I cut for my cabin. And they said, that's enough. You, you've got to stop cutting trees. And I was like, oh, guys, you know, you're tying my hands here, making it more difficult to survive. But yeah. we try to find dead trees. So yeah. when, when, with that whole situation, I knew what was coming. I hoped it wouldn't get to that. And um, I'd never at any moment did I think, am I going to lay a hand on this person? Yeah. Um, me trying to grab just a piece of tarp or my inner tube, yeah. my inner tube, my property. It was like, <laughs> oh, my God. It was like... Um, like I was thinking of Red Fox in Sanford and Son when he would go, oh, and throw his hands up in the air and act <laughs> like, like he was dying. And I thought, wow, Jill, you're just overreacting when I'm trying to protect myself and my property. I'm not touching you. I'm not hurting you. And yeah. it seemed as if anything I did to try to pr protect myself, that was breaking the rules for her. But whatever yeah. she did was perfectly fine. Yeah. That's how well, she that justified it. And for anybody watching, you can you can go check out my interview with Joel because I think what we we discussed there is the is the in more depth is the flaw in the game in that there really isn't anything you can do to defend yourself. Yeah. Um, because without the threat of physical violence or uh, anybody you know uh, being able to really defend themselves or or their stuff, um, you the other person you, you just have to kind of either sit there and take it or as Joel discussed you have to go then and do the same thing to that person. And, you know, yeah. he, he goes into like, he went in with me talking about how that's why his motivation to quit the game was realizing that he had lost and realizing that to, because this is just going to go back and forth. The only option was to make sure that they lost, they lost as well, but that, you know, he wasn't really into that. So, um, yeah. so I, I totally, I, I feel like if, if anybody from Outlast Productions watching, I just think if you have a season two, I, I think that there's just, there's gotta be some sort of op option for people to, to protect against this, this uh, tactic from other teams. And so I, my question is, do you have any suggestions or any thoughts that if there was a rule, like, you know, a rule change that could happen to, to make the game a little bit more fair? Yeah, I, I, I honestly believe, and I've, I've talked about this a bit on Reddit. Um, there, there's, it's kind of, um, I think, like a, a, a tr like a trifecta, the core three things that that we need. Uh, one, I would eliminate the the cash prize. I would completely eliminate that. <laughs> I think true survivalist, we will do this competition for the love of actually the challenge. Um, there's, the, there's a marathon that just happened last week. I think it's called the Bradley or Bentley Marathon. There's no, there's no, you don't win anything. It is the most grueling marathon. I think it's 100 miles through the most treacherous of, of, of uh, locations. And uh, only three people won recently. And uh, uh, the only thing they win is a handshake and, uh, you know, some beers. I would totally do this again for a beer <laughs> you know make me a steak give me a beer if i win and uh i would just say yes i uh, i survived i outlasted the second thing is um i think there needs to be like you can't enter another camp that's it a, a simple rule don't enter another camp off limits um the third rule i think there would be it would be good to have um kind of a like a a game warden, uh, somebody who came, co can come in and say, uh, this is teetering on the point of, uh, you know, the, uh, out of bounds. Yeah. Like you can't do this. Yeah. So warning them saying, we give you one warning. Uh, here's a, a flag. And then uh, second warning, hey, this is your second warning. You, you can't do this. Third warning, you're out. Red flag and you're off. You, you, you got to get out. So uh, almost like, if we're going to do it as, as, a, as a competition and you could actually kind of uh, potentially hurt other people, then uh, bring in some rules, like, just like uh, football or uh, uh, you know, uh, soccer. Yeah. Bring in a three, three strikes, you're out. Got it. Uh, that's really interesting. 
that the, the, the I like the trifecta there. The um, so I, I I'm bouncing around here because I just I have all these things that, as you're talking that are going through my head. Um, so speaking of rules, one of the one of the only rules, right, is that you have to be part of a team. And yeah. as we've discussed, your 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 team has dwindled down. You know, you you lost people early, then Brian leaves, and then you're trying to join these other teams. When you got to Charlie, we talked about your pitch. I think I'm I'm curious to know what your sense of is why they didn't go with your pitch there. Because what I guessing I'm just guessing as a viewer, and especially based off Paul's confessions, confessionals um, about his motivation of wanting to play chess. And while he wasn't getting as dirty as Alpha Team, you know, he's definitely there to try to win and and to play to win. And I was just like in my head, I was like, I don't know if I, if you're really try, if someone their motivation is to win win purely, you know, the money <laughs> for themselves and their team and everything. Like I wouldn't except Javier based on the fact that I just have to split that million dollar prize with one more person. If your team does win. And do you, do you get the sense that that was his motivation or is there anything else that you think was, was going into it? Um, I, I don't think the money was a motivation. So we never, we never went in uh, thinking that uh, it was a million split with however many teammates oh. we went in. Uh, and I, again, I, I also mentioned this on Reddit is we went knowing that our prize would be $250,000. So each oh, person okay. would win $250,000. And uh, because I think if, if it would have been the mentality that whatever team gets a million, then what is to motivate people to keep more than two people? Yeah. If you have to be in a team and you have to finish in a team and it was for the million, then I would think, Oh, then people are going to have another twisted mentality and say, we got to eliminate somebody to get 500,000 each. Yeah. Can you clarify for me then what was the actual way that the prize money was distributed? Was it divided among the three? I, I honestly don't know. You don't I, even know. Okay. I don't know how that was divided by them, but okay. I know the contract that I, I signed was 250,000. And that's okay. all we were ever guaranteed. Got it. Okay. And um, the show, the, the show narrator just says they're everyone's playing for a potential million dollars. That that's I think the only thing that they share um, about. The yeah, I, I think that was assuming that because we all started out as a team of four. Yeah, yeah, got it. So I'm thinking uh, as a team of four and two hundred fifty thousand each, then it's a million. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but yeah, that from my understanding, that's the only thing that that and I knew because uh, we asked and I wanted to clarify before I went over there. And um, I said, guys, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to be I, – I told him I don't want to be a burden. So if you, you, if you guys allow me on the team or not, I'll leave. Um, looking, thinking back, and I don't think this was – this wasn't something that I thought of at the time. But seeing that Angie left uh, three days after I left, I was thinking maybe if I asked, I could have set up camp built my own shelter and just <laughs> hung out for until the, uh, Charlie accepted me. Maybe Charlie would have accepted me if Angie had to go out because of medical reasons. Maybe I could have hung out for three days and said, guys, what about now? So, because you so, had to finish in a team and we weren't near finishing yet. We were still like two weeks. Okay. It, that's really interesting. So again, the rules were not very clear watching the show. So you, there was nobody that was telling you once there was no pro producer or anything saying once they didn't accept you, there was no one saying, Hey, you have to leave. It was just your understanding of the game that, that made you shoot your flare. Yeah. I I'm pretty sure my understanding was, well, I'm not in a team. I have to go, yeah. but I, you know, hindsight, I was thinking, could I have proposed to them? Yeah. Guys, can I create my camp? hang out until somebody does adopt me. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't think of it at the time. I just yeah. assumed, okay, I'm out. I'm not in a team. Yeah. So I left. Yeah. And I mean, it's understandable, especially too, because like you were kind of the, uh, I don't know, the no room at the end, um, traveling Joseph there or something, because you know, you're, <laughs> you're trying to find a team with you. You had a Brian, you didn't get, you couldn't get it with Delta. They, they were done. And then yeah, Charlie wouldn't accept you. So, I can understand, you know, just the feeling of, of, uh, you know, being at the end of your rope there. Um, so, and, you know, surviving off muscles. I know you said you were, you were more well-fed than, than any other team, but 
uh, I'm sure you're still, you know, you're not being able. It's it's different than me sitting on my couch saying, oh, you could have done this or you could have done that when, you know, I'm, I'm living off of, you know, a couple thousand calories a day here. Yeah, we uh, uh, honestly watching the show and seeing how everybody was complaining about uh, being hungry and talking about protein all the time. I was amazed because I'm thinking if, if and I know that uh, they have the footage. I've asked if we can get it. The mountain of shells there we have. I mean, it's just like a <laughs> three, three or four foot high mountain yeah. of muscle shells. We ate so many. Me and Brian were pounding them, and uh, oh, it was. And we were we were regular. <laughs> we were going to the bathroom every day. Yeah. But an inside detail that is a little disgusting. But the muscles started to smell exactly the same way coming out. So when you cook the muscles and you eat it, and that's the only thing you're eating, when it comes out, it smells exactly like the muscles you ate. So that getting in your head, thinking, oh, God, I, <laughs> this is not good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm sure then you start to associate the muscles with a smell that is not pleasant either. So yeah. That's a vicious cycle there. Um, yeah. So. Well, props to you. I mean, this is uh, th it was it was a really compelling TV um to watch you know even as i am a i'm very much a city slicker i'm here out in california you know i've been camping a handful of times but uh never you know anything close to this and it was it was really wild to see um just the, the um incredible 27 log cabin that you built um you know to <laughs> see to even hear that you're setting up booby traps there i mean that's that, that is unfathomable to me uh that you you were able to do that so um congrats on that is there anything just that we didn't see that you just want to touch on that you would like, you're just like, oh, I really wish people knew this before we get out of here. Um, Cause I, I know we got to run. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, of course the, I felt that the show was hijacked by uh, the demon squad and um, they, they could only fit so much into a series. I mean, yeah, it could have been 16 episodes really. And sure. it would have been, it would have shown more bushcraft and more things like um, maybe the teas that I made or the 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 even the things that Jill did uh, researching um, uh, the local plants that we were picking. I would have loved to have seen all that, but yeah. because the the way it's hijacked, um, they had to kind of show um, the intensity, and it was a short time that. You could see people starting to get hungry after a week. So their eyes started to change and yeah. you had to just jump into that or else it would have been like a whole, a whole week of intense, intense bushcraft stuff. And then yeah. all of a sudden madness. So I'm not sure if it would have had the same effect in the way they, they did. They told the story, but yeah. um, there was plenty of bushcraft stuff, guys. There was plenty of survivalist stuff. I know that you wanted to see it and read it. They wanted to see it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Unfortunately, you know, they, they, they had to do what they had to do to, to cram it into eight episodes. Yeah. Well, uh, it sounds like you need to start your own, you know, YouTube channel or something, you know, like uh, nature with Javier or surviving, you know, <laughs> um, outlasting with Javier or something like that. I feel like uh, if it, you have the skills and you like you're saying, you could create some compelling uh, content there. Just a well, suggestion. I, I do have Hungry Guy on a Bicycle. I have that's my YouTube channel, my okay. Instagram and uh, I'm, I also have in TikTok, Hungry Guy on a Bicycle. Oh, you're already so, on top of it. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm going to try to start uploading more videos. But I think that what's going to differentiate me from other survivalists is um, I'm really going to focus on getting to places, difficult to reach places by bicycle, and then surviving off the land in that way. So I will start to upload more things. And uh, I guess my niche is uh, is bikepacking around the world to exotic locations. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know you just got back from Asia. Do you have any other trips planned? Um, you know, if somebody was to subscribe to your YouTube channel, is there another? What? Where are you going to be next? Yeah. So I will do a trip in the U.S. Uh, shortly. I'm going to be in Oklahoma in a couple of weeks and hog hunting over there, and then uh, I'll be working my way back over to the 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 West Coast. Uh, in the future, I will. I am planning to do all of Japan, the entire island by bicycle. 
so flying there recently just for five days, that was basically just to get some good food and to learn Tokyo. So uh, when I land in a city with my bicycle, I put my bicycle together in the airport and I literally ride out of the airport and go into town. And so Tokyo is a huge city. I had to get the, the kind of the, the, to learn the lay of the land so that I could ride out of the city easier from the airport. And that's what I typically do when I, I, I tour a country is I fly into a country, learn the airport a little bit, learn the, learn the uh, surroundings, and then I'll return with my bicycle and uh, start my adventures. Wow. That's awesome. Well, uh, you have one new subscriber now. Um, I am now subscribed to your channel, so I'll be checking it out when you uh, post your, your Tokyo or your, uh, not just Tokyo, your entire Japan video. So that'll be fun. Okay. Um, Great. Uh, so last, I just, yeah, again, anything else that there, that was not covered on the show, I have some rapid fire questions. Um, if there's nothing else that you want to get to. No, no, shoot the rapid fires. Okay. First, I just want to, I, I just want to hear your, like, you know, quick one sentence thoughts on all these other people that, you know, we haven't really touched on. So what was it like living out there with Tim? Oh, Tim. Um, I think there was a lot of, uh, unmet expectations okay what about Corey? Corey was uh i think he was going to teach me a lot about hunting and unfortunately we 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 didn't get the chance to do that okay got it now um the uh the other question i have here is are, would you be interested in doing any other sort of reality tv show um, it sounds like you're not very motive, money motivated, but you know, uh, is there anything else, any other kind of show that you would like to be on? Oh, um, I, I'm totally up for and open for anything. Okay. Uh, I, I take this as another, um, opportunity to have a different adventure. One okay. that's not so physical. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's physical the by that... being on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Outlast season five, they're doing an all-star season, but this time they're bringing back, you know, the best from, you know, four teams from the first four seasons, uh, the, the biggest characters from each season. It's you, it's Jill, and it's two other people out there. Are you saying yes to go out in that season? Absolutely. That's your starting team. I still got to beat Jill. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Great. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, there's been a lot of rhetoric. There's been a lot of online harassment dedicated towards, um, Jill and Amber, um, you know, obviously like whatever people think of them, um, and the show, um, are you, you're on the same page with me that they don't deserve death threats or the harassment that they're receiving online. I, I, I do agree with that. However, I do believe that their insistence on, um, not taking any responsibility for their actions is inviting more hatred. Sure. And um, it's unfortunate, but I think the ladies just refuse to take any responsibility for anything that they've done. And um, they keep deflecting and making excuses for things. And uh, ladies, Jill, Amber, I'm sure you're going to see this. Just, just stop that. You're getting more heat because of it. Okay. Um, well, yeah, again, anybody watching, um, I, I just want to say, take a page out of Javier's book, kill him with kindness. Okay. You know, I, I yeah. think, uh, while it is, you know, while all was very real, uh, they do not deserve to be, uh, you know, their lives do not deserve to be threatened. Um, you know, you don't need to go out of your way to, uh, you know, harass them or, you know, I, ask them questions. I'm sure, you know, Jill and Amber, like, you know, uh, understand that that's part of what it means to be on a reality show. But um, I just want to turn the rhetoric down a little bit and say that they, they're, they're still humans and, and deserve, uh, you know, not to be, um, feel like their life is in danger for decisions they made out there. Okay. Um, well, uh, Javier, I think that's all. That's I'm looking at my list of questions. Thank you for being so, uh, so gracious with your time here to answer everything. Um, you can check out again, Javier at hungry guy on a bicycle, um, on all the platforms he's discussed. You can find me, Josh Kettles at Josh Kettles on social media. I'm also, um, you know, covering this, uh, current season of survivor, um, at the uh, future past survivor cast. You can just go to future past survivor.com, um, to subscribe there. Um, and yeah, again, I'm very excited. I hopeful, I'm hopeful that there is another season of outlast coming because it was fascinating. Hope for, hoping for a little bit of uh, yeah, some rule tweaks. We'll see if we can get those just to, to make the game um, game design a little bit more balanced 
And if so, I think this is a compelling TV show. So Javier, <laughs> uh, hope, hope to stay in touch. And, uh, you know, you can find me, um, you know, if you ever need anything. Thank you. Thanks for the time. All right. Well, thank you, Javier. Thank you, everybody. And make sure if you are subscribed to Silent Podcast to give us a rating and review helps, um, you know, us find any um, or helps uh, more people find interviews like this with your favorite reality TV contestants. So thank you all. Have a great day. And maybe we'll see you back for Outlast season two.